Hello, everyone. Russ of Aquarimax here. I'm here with Aaron of Arthropod Ambassadors. How's everybody doing this evening, afternoon, whatever it is for you, wherever you are? For Tristan, it's 12.30 a.m. in the morning. Wow. <laughs> okay. Well, welcome, Aaron. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, great to be here. Yeah, I've been excited to talk to you. Uh, Aaron is uh, from Oregon, and she recently graduated from the University of Oregon with a major in environmental studies, minors in ethics and food studies. I love the way that you tied that together, too. We'll talk it's about a that really some more. Fun, it was really nice how the classes bounced off each other. I was very engaged with my studies. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, really interesting. She's She's had a lot of different types of animals from reptiles, chickens, horses, volunteered with veterinarians and wildlife rescue, that kind of thing. And she currently runs Arthropod Ambassadors uh, with the purpose of interaction between people and invertebrates, trying to inspire others to look to the world's smallest inhabitants to answer our biggest problems, which I think is awesome. Okay. So once again, welcome. This is exciting. Yeah. Great to be here. Still. We are going to open this up to uh, questions pretty soon, but uh, one question that I wanted to get your um, input on, this is a question from one of our patrons, mm -hmm. um, Eileen O'Donnell, and she had, I'm going to pull it up real quick here. Um, she's in the chat, by the way. Hello, Eileen. Hi, Eileen. We've, got a, question. we've got a cool question I think that you'll resonate with probably. Okay. It says, um, Eileen says, I occasionally find dead moths in odd corners of my home or near windows and wonder, is this something I can throw into my isopod enclosure for them to ingest? Curious what you think. So do you want to chime in on that? Ooh, boy, um, depending on the species, certain moths definitely have like difficult chemicals for other critters to break down. So it might be species dependent. I definitely have an issue with pantry moths. Anybody else has that issue? I, I feel you too. Um, and they are one of the most satisfying things to give to my mantises <laughs> or baby tarantulas. Um, kind of makes it fun to have around after all. you're just like, ah, oh, free food. Um, as long as you're not spraying any chemical questionable stuff as well, there's also an issue with maybe chemicals building up in those species. That might be one of the reasons. If you can find them live, I would be less hesitant, but if they're dead, Another thing you can do if you want to try it out is maybe get a smaller group of isopods and see how they do with that instead of introducing it to your full colony. Um, there's also a lot of uh, pests, uh, parasites with invertebrates, weirdly enough. There's, you know, nematodes are the ones that really rule the world and or uh, a lot of the issues with introducing control species has been they've had parasites that have gone on to bee populations and things like that. So. There's actually a whole world of invertebrate things we don't know much about, but it's, that's one of the ways we learn. So I would say go for it with a smaller group and yeah. let us know how it goes. I, I love that answer. I don't know that there'd be a whole lot I would add to that. Um, I, I remember Peter at Bugs in Cyberspace talking about uh, moving into a house and having been there for a couple of years, and he set down a mantis on the uh, the windowsill and realized somebody had sprayed it because the mantis started going into convulsions almost immediately. He was able to remove it and save it. But uh, yeah, is, and you know, I don't use pesticides in the house or anything, but uh, I would be concerned about that kind of thing. Like you mentioned, um, uh, the small kind of control group is a great idea. So, I mean, even without pesticides, certain things we build our houses with currently, if that animal, if that's what it pupated with, it could have, built up those toxins and been okay with that animal. That's one of the dangerous things. You've got like the hornworms, the, the tomato worms, if they're fed their natural diet, tomatoes are toxic. So it actually protects those worms. Right. Um, they can be fed something else, but yeah, the bioaccumulation is the tricky, tricky thing. Yeah, definitely. Good point. And great then, question too. yeah, that was a great question. So we, let's see, formal top hat getting his first millipedes. That's often. It looks like we've got Newt, uh, Eddie, Critters and More, Crystals, Pets and Plants, Sandy Sizemore's in the house. Lots of people. Okay, so Eileen's going to try the small group idea. That's awesome. Great. And let's see. Oh, young lad, you're welcome. He liked the isopod death video, meaning <laughs> causes of isopod death video. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of them. It's really hard to answer those kind of questions. What killed them? It's like, oh, man, we're uh, so so many options. Yeah, exactly. So uh, let's talk about um, 
a couple of things. You, you've had a, a lot of cool things going on there. Um, and one of them is mantises. So you can, can you tell us a little bit about the species that you keep right now? So when I was a kid, I started out with long before I even knew this was a hobby and things like that. I would go out and get adult females during the time of year where they've probably been mated with. And then I'd bring them into the house and put them in a little container with holes and feed them for a while. And then their Uthika would lay. And these are a temperate species. So they end up passing away seasonally pretty quickly after laying. And then that Uthika would go, Uthika is the egg case, and that goes out into the garden. And then I get to see more mantises at home instead of having to go find them. And mm -hmm. so I really kept a population. Um, they were most likely the European mantis, Relig Religulosa, Religulosa, however you're supposed to say it in Latin. And then uh, after years after that, going through college, I went to an expo and found out about the ghost mantises. This is some art by Mother of Spiders. Um, they are a little smaller, but really, really easy to take care of and a little bit shy, so they can actually be kept in a group together pretty successfully. Mm -hmm. And so started with those and then just kind of have been trying out this and that species beyond that. I really feel with, I, I started with uh, cockroaches as far as the arthropod ambassadors. I was really interested in cockroaches and the idea of them working really well in a livestock setting. You can feed your chickens, you can get compost broken down quicker. A lot of really nice things about cockroaches and cockroaches and mantises are actually very closely related um, and you can kind of see it in the head shape of a cockroach and so oh, totally. i kind of moved from well mantises are everybody's favorite and if they tie in that closely with cockroaches this will really be a good way to represent everybody um, mm -hmm. as a as the life tree and yeah i try to stick to species that i try to at least the extra species that i end up selling i try to stick to species that are pretty bomb proof i've I've mm -hmm. worked with devil's flowers and a couple other less uh, easy species. And I, I don't think I'd want somebody to start on that because I don't want people to have a bad experience with care. Um, right. Mantises already have a short lifespan. So having a shorter one is pretty bummer, especially with the current price tags in the market. Right. Um, yeah. But, and it's also, I really like them. Their, their quick life seems like a downer, but really the yearly cycle and being able to like, learn things and have that individual and have a new animal. And a lot of times it's kind of a good way to work with children learning about the life cycle and loss and death and new babies. And it's, it's a really compact version of that lesson, which I think is really important as how we navigate our own world. So immenses represent that really well. True, very good point. So uh, on the topic of mantises, Invertebrate Dude, welcome to the stream. He says, hey. what are both of your dream mantids? I mean, if I wasn't having to take care of them <laughs> and it didn't have to do with all that, the dragon mantis that is barely in culture currently is amazing. That thing is just outrageously ornate. And the emerald bark man, I'm, I'm going to get in trouble with invertebrate dude because I'm terrible on my scientific names. I would recognize the scientific name. I'm not going to try to say it live. Um, but the emerald bark mantises are pretty amazing, especially the fact that, again, they um, are one of the closest represent, they look the closest to um, cockroaches, along with desert species of mantises, really have that cockroach shape. So it helps link it back to cockroaches as well as they're metallic and amazing. And it's kind of interesting to think that a, a dark rainbow metallic is what they're using to blend in with the bark. You wouldn't think of something shiny blending in, but when you get back from it, the light catching really does break up the shape of an animal. So it's interesting to see an iridescent animals actually being a cryptic form. Interesting. Yeah, that's that reminds me of the uh, fact that a lot of these things that we don't think of as, uh, that we do think of as cryptic are sometimes, on the flip side, are sometimes advertising themselves with UV light mm -hmm. or in, yeah. in the, on the UV spectrum. And it's interesting to just, our perspectives are limited. And when we start to look at those broader pictures, different perspectives, there's so much to take in. Yeah, I've actually, when I was doing my studies, they were talking about, we were studying butterflies and the issues of edge habitat and things. And um, a lot of insects search for water by using uh, polar, polarized light. Oh, yeah. And the polarized windows within cities were causing insects to like flock into the city, sensing water and dehydrate and die. So there was entire, not even just the moths that exhaust themselves at the light, but a whole other group of species that we don't even understand that were causing to yeah be completely confused and unable wow. to navigate their landscape yeah just because we had no idea of what they were perceiving yep now we do we're learning yeah, yeah <laughs> that's, that's true gotta do <laughs> well i think for me uh, 
dream mantis. I mean, I love orchid mantises, and Peter was nice enough to send me one. I love that thing. And we got to see it. Uh, he sent it to us in its penultimate molt. And so we saw the, the terminal molt nice. and kept it for, you know, quite a while. They don't live all that long, but uh, I guess the orchid mantises can live a fair bit as adults, but uh, we don't have it anymore, but it was great. And the nice thing is my wife loved it as much as I did, which is great because she's not always that excited about all the invertebrates, but she was about the orchid mantis. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I actually had somebody write me. I had one female orchid and she had uh, been the only one that wasn't good with my male. So I had one male and three females and she took care of that and never got bred. And so I had somebody email me on Instagram and say something about her partner was in entomology and she really feels like an orchid would help her be interested because she was amazed by them singularly as an insect. So she's like, maybe this is my jumping off point. Yeah. And it's kind of a ha ha elbow joke and a lot of mantis things to be like, you got an orchid mantis. Like that's kind of the, no, no one's has an orchid. They're pretty rare in the hobby and, or they're the first thing people ask for. Yeah. So getting that thing that's like, do you have an orchid mantis? But she had such a, she put it together so well. I was like, yes, I do. I have one. And she was close enough to be able to even drive down. So it didn't have to get sent through the mail. Nice. And she was so adorably stoked. And I was like, that's, this is, this is why I do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know what you mean. It's lovely to see that, that level of enthusiasm and in, um, investment into yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Therapod Hunter. Oh, do you keep any millipedes, Erin? I don't. I've had, we, I, we have one centipede currently, and then I've had one or two natural tanks from outside where I've just taken this and that detritus and put it together. I've done that with like a wet tank, like a pond tank, and then like a muck tank. Mm -hmm. um, they usually either go back outside because that's the best thing about that kind of tank. I can get tired of it and just let it back outside. <laughs> True. And, or I forget about them and they dry out and I find them in the corner where they are. They're a little too needy for me. Um, I need to set it up so they're in a cockroach bin style so they actually hold their humidity, but I've always done them in an open tank and it's just that much more care. So no, I'm bad true. at millipedes, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. Yeah, Therapod was just wondering about his uh, millipede that occasionally flails about and rolls over in a drastic way. I've seen that, but I don't know why exactly they do it. Uh, but I have seen it, especially with flame leg millipedes, um, maybe once in a while with ivories, but I don't really know what the behavior is um, based on. Um, oh, this is here's a success story. Sandy Sizemore says she lived in the South for 18 years and hated, 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 so really hated, the roaches and palmetto or palmetto bugs. Now I have my second dubia colony. I hate feeding them off. They're so pretty. <laughs> nice. So that is Dubias awesome. are cute because the ladies don't have, they're just big, big ladies with no wings. And then the boys are nice and sleek and quick. I, I really like the... Um, the dimorphism with the sexes a lot of those species it's pretty neat <laughs> yeah yeah there's some interesting stuff going on there for sure supreme gecko says aaron what is the one thing you see mantis keepers doing wrong that could easily be changed nice question um i would i'm gonna say two first humidity doesn't mean stagnant air so a lot of people that think they need a high humidity species they leave the air stagnant instead of having a good humidity regimen and the bacterial infections are commonly a bigger problem with the species that need higher humidity. So I would say that. Um, and then also I think a lot of people fuss about needing flying insects and that keeps a lot of people from trying certain species because raising, raising feeders is one thing, raising flying feeders is another <laughs> and flies are a bugger. Um, and I've found, especially with the cat eye mantises, this little lady, that I just got done feeding. But this species, I'll take a superworm and open the front of the superworm, euthanize the superworm, and then just tap it to their face. Mm -hmm. And they'll they'll be as scared at first, and sometimes you need to reapproach the mantis. But as soon as they like start tasting food, they kind of like start eating it. And being scared isn't really a nah, and then they grab it and start eating. So a lot of times you can get a large species that maybe you have a communal species like this and mantises tolerate each other until they're hungry enough. There's no mantis species that is communal in the way that I would consider the definition of communal, having different like hierarchies and or enjoying each other's presence. Right. They just prefer smaller food if they're better at being communal. 
Um, so with that situation, if you're out of flies, you, you think you're in trouble, but you can really feed them, hand feed them with a little bit of patience. Ooh, so cool. I think the, fly, the flying food aspect is certain people swear that um, the nutrition is different. And I haven't kept any of the mantises that are picky about the nutrition, but again, mm -hmm. feeder, a feeder is what it was fed and or variety is really important. So one or two super worms in a regular feeding schedule isn't going to be negative. Not going to be a big problem. Yeah. yeah. Have you ever found that once they've tasted superworms, they recognize them as a food source later, or does it always have to be kind of a hand fed situation? They won't go down to hunt them out. You can kind of try to like put them in a cup and elevate that cup and see if they'll approach it the right way. But there are certain species will just stay on the top. And if their feeder doesn't approach them, a lot of times I suggest, um, especially with like the ghosts are a little bit braver with their feeding. You can take them, if you want to have a really nice enclosure, a big setup, really pretty for you, you can take your mantis out during feeding time and put it in a just simple cube with nothing in it and or a bigger enclosure that they can spot that prey and let them have their feeding time, look at their abdomen, make sure they're nice and fed and then put them back in the really nice enclosure. But one of the more dangerous things about mantises that's kind of counterintuitive is people want to set their, it's great, people want to set their animals up in really beautiful, bioactive, awesome setups now. But if a mantis can't see or find its food because it's hiding in the corner because it's found its own niche in that beautiful setup, mm -hmm. you're, you're keeping cockroaches and mantises and flies. <laughs> you're not, <laughs> which is great. But yeah, definitely keep them separated out if you're worried about feeding them. And they'll, they'll spot their food most of the time, but yeah, don't don't hope they'll find it. Cause, right. But you can really watch their abdomen and be able to tell if they are in need. Getting, getting to that point. Mm -hmm. This is this is fascinating. This the cat eyed mantis you just showed us. It's huge. Yeah, yeah, she's yeah. she's doing a good job too. I've got two ooths from her. I think there's seven in the big. It's the th two foot by four foot enclosures, so they're like three times as big as this. I have a big colony mm -hmm. of them, and they've been <laughs> great. They've been really great, and they haven't missed. A lot of times you see something that sleek and thin and you're like, this is going to miss molt like crazy. Like these mm -hmm. and devil's flowers and a few others are like every molt is a celebration. But I've only had maybe one miss molt with these guys. And they don't when I do spray them, they don't seem excited. They don't really seem that interested in water compared to a lot of other species. So they seem like they handle dry better than you'd think for something that looks like it's going to not be able to get out of its skin. So even, even thing, the misting is about it, with almost all invertebrates that I've talked to people about, it's about being hydrated before a molt, not misting during a molt. I feel like mm -hmm. that's a misconception a lot in the invert hobby. Okay, so as oh, long as as long as they get a good drink before they molt, basically, it's like their yeah their inner their inner water levels and their 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 being hydrated is what's going to cause success, not them mm -hmm. being wet from the not outside. them actually being damp, and yeah, allowing that. their fluids to push themselves out, kind of thing. So. That makes a lot of sense, just knowing what we do about how molds work. So, yeah, I don't know that I ever thought about it in that term. So that's a great, that's a great tip. Thank you. So do the, uh, I couldn't really tell from when we saw her before, do the cat-eyed mantis females have wings, the visible wings? They both do. Hers are a little shorter. You can back out. They're, they're also really easy to handle. I've had the bigger, like, Asian mantises mm -hmm. attack me, like, straight up, <laughs> not just defense posture but like try to grab and bite like they want to eat you animals. i've never this animal doesn't act that way so as far as like with children um they'll put it up in display every once in a while she's not gonna like this maybe yeah wow. that was good <laughs> that was very surprisingly good nice. yeah they're just i mean oh i have to figure out where the camera is on this guy again do, 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 right there are you gonna look that way you can see that crazy head oh i love it they're pretty insane. Oh yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. In the U.S., you can't have phasmids, but you don't need to because these mantises are. Yeah, you got your stick bug. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they basically fit the bill. That is so cool. <laughs> yeah, they're a fun species. Uh, very much, and that's the other thing. You can kind of tell how a mantis is going to act by its build. Like the leaf-shaped mantises just fall over and pretend they're a leaf. The stick ones just kind of like wave around and don't but then one that has a threat display and is pretty thickly built can grab a hold of you proper like. And I remember that with just the native species. I remember getting bit a lot as a kid. Oh, me too. I just, I just can't help myself. <laughs> <laughs> the first Grabbing mantis I ever caught. Yeah, the first mantis I ever caught was a large female 
that uh, grabbed me back yeah. immediately. And that's what I remember. It's amazing. It's like a crab. Their mobility is pretty much impossible to grab hold of. Yeah. It was quite fantastic and memorable, but uh, I didn't let go because I really wanted a mantis. So, yeah, you're not venomous, yeah. so you're good. Exactly. So I just saw a question, a, good, a great question here. Okay. Science Lair says, are all mantis are all mantids ambush predators or do any of them hunt slash chase prey? Definitely sight based, but not ambush, I would say. There's the ones that the more cryptic they are, the more likely they're gonna sit there until something walks by. But my bigger girl that's hiding in here and I don't really want to pull her out yet. Um, she'll spot something across the enclosure and chase it down. So mm -hmm. definitely I I would almost say you can tell by how cryptic they are. Mm -hmm. And also how hungry they are. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. My my giant Asian mantids that I've had in the past were more go after the food and, and you know, find it from across the enclosure and go after it than uh, some of the, especially like a male Chinese mantis. Mm -hmm. When they're adults, they, they barely care about food. They're like, oh, I want his mate. And so they'll just mm -hmm. sit there and the food just does whatever it wants. And they don't care. Yeah. But yeah. I actually learned that face feeding thing with my male ghosts because I was like, okay, you guys are literally dying because you're not eating at a certain point i wonder if i can extend that so i just started opening up mealworms and putting it on their mouth and they would eat at that point and i so i need to do another test on it and have similar aged individuals but i'm pretty sure i extended their life by a couple weeks at least like it seemed nice. like they once they were fed they got the energy back to wait mm -hmm. for what they actually wanted longer yeah once once the males have wings and those long antenna they're they're using them. <laughs> they want to go, go, go and find those hormones. So. Exactly. Exactly. The uh, Therapod Hunter has a question about um, our, okay, it says, what is the minimum width of an arboreal enclosure for mantids? I have a 20 centimeter wide cylindrical enclosure I haven't used yet. Awesome. I, so one of the important things, not just the size, but where the mantis can hang from, a lot of different mantises have different abilities to cling. So check your species and make sure that you have a flat, upside down surface that they'll be able to hold from. From that surface, if you have a non-adult, you're gonna to need to worry about molting. And molting is gonna be the size of the individual as it was, plus the size it is when it's new. So people usually say three times the, tall, the length of the animal just to have a safe molt, but that's three times clear space. So if you have things in there, you're gonna need it to be larger so that that clear space is that size. Right. Um, so yeah, the size of your animal times three, and then add some decorations not in that included volume. <laughs> in that space. Yeah. Cool. So and same. Then past that, oh, honestly, they they really don't. I kind of one of the things I like about them in captivity and human care is, I've had mantises outside in the yard that are wild, and if they were being fed, they were on that spot. I could go to the four spots in my backyard where there was a mantis, give each one of them a mealworm, and go back in. And they don't, the males, like I said, want to take off and go, but a female's going to hang out and want food. And so as far as keeping them in human care, it's it's really not that unnatural. You're not going to get as much pacing as you would with a higher animal that's lifestyle is to wander. So right. I find them to be a good pet for that reason as well. Exactly. Yeah. And I remember. Keeps the need size a little smaller. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. My When we were, uh, when my kids were little, we had a, a mantis that uh, took up residency on our back uh, screen door and we would feed it by hand and stuff. His name was Bob. Probably it was a female because she stayed there, but at the time we didn't pay attention to that so much, but uh, yeah, the, the kids uh, got a good introduction to uh, mantis at that point. It was fun. Great. Yeah. So let's see, uh, lots of good comments here and questions. Uh, Supreme Gecko Wally is asking, Best way to introduce mantids for breeding? Any good suggestions? Ooh, Peter's tackled this one before, and I definitely agree with him. Bugs in cyberspace. We're always talking about Peter. Everybody knows that's oh yeah people. Okay, yeah. Um, uh, a female's gonna not just have to be mature, but letting out pheromones. Sometimes you can tell that by they'll kind of hunch their abdomen in a way that's awkward, and you'll be like, "What's that?" That's usually her releasing pheromones. It's oftentimes about a month after for some of the larger females after their final molt. So if you put a male in before that, she's not actually sex sexually mature and she's hungry. So that's not gonna work out. A lot right. of times, like Peter said, you can kind of tell by how the male is acting. If the male is perked up and catching those pheromones, 
he'll let you know. Um, I've kind of noticed that they like to be, so since they're trying to be cryptic and blend in and mating is an activity that might get them caught because there's movement within it, they seem to like to do it at night and or when there's no disturbances. So being there and really watching them and a lot of movement will cause a lack of success. It is nice because they're not venomous. So even when the female, if you do have an accident and you're far enough away to observe it without having been right there, she's not going to envenomate him. So he's going to survive for a while before she can actually kill him, which is like one of the bummer things about watching a mantis eat. It's like, oh, I hope he starts at the right spot. But at the same time, when you're trying to breed, it's not dead. Man like with a tarantula, it's like, oh, bye. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not going to survive that. But yeah, I, they, they have a pheromone schedule that the males will let you know if it's happening. I've heard and read with uh, the Keeping Praying Mantises with Oren's book that if you have the males and the females in the same room, sometimes the pheromones will kind of overwhelm the males. So it's kind of good to keep them away until you want them to pick up on it because it'll kind of overwhelm them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, watch your mantises. They'll let you know. They'll, they want to be successful too, because life goes on. True. Good point. A lot of that stuff. So Sandy is asking what a mantis bite is like. It's a pinch. There's, like I said, there's no venom. Um, so it's, it's all mechanical, but depending on the size, some of them can barely get you. And then some of the larger ones that are pretty popular in the hobby grab a hold so this little lady hardly has any mandibles but her sister inside here is i wouldn't want to mess with hmm. uh, <laughs> enough of a variation with the mandibles in the species huh yeah and i i mean a lot of the pinch is going to even just be from those claws it's not even the bite that's pinching you so but right. at the same time you're more of a danger to the mantis because as soon as you fling them with any force as they're holding on they're going to probably burst their abdomen or something like that. So you have to stick it out and get bit and remove them carefully. <laughs> but yeah. really, I mean, especially the species I work with, it's the one giant Asian mantis is the only one that I had that was like difficult to work with. Everybody else would rather just draw a mow and be out of there and not have to think about it. Shy. Right. <laughs> and I've and noticed- You probably figured, you've probably noticed that with your orchid too. She wasn't too nasty. Yeah, she was, she never tried to do anything that was remotely painful. The, uh, the large Chinese mantises I used to find were, they were pretty vicious when I first caught them. And of course they'd calm down with time, but the, yeah, the, uh, in terms of the, not that they were vicious, but what I mean is that initial defensive grab with those raptorial forelegs kind of hurt. <laughs> it was, a, it's kind of like uh, meeting a rose bush that's mad at you. Well, and they'll, they'll try, a lot of those species will throw every wing up and try to be the scariest thing you can. That's one of my favorite things about the spiny flowers. They have those false eye circles oh, yes. and they use them. And so a lot of times when you see pictures of mantises in full display, it's like you had to really bother that animal to get it to that point. I don't even know if that's really worth the photography, but you can barely move a spiny and it's just like, I'm scary. I have eyeballs. <laughs> <laughs> and I know as a keeper, I'm like, oh, that didn't take any like real bothering. That was just you like walked by and it saw you sort of a thing. So it's really right. to see that full spectrum of display before having to actually have a confrontation. Yeah, I think the only time I've ever seen a Chinese mantis do that was when I found one that a cat had been bothering. Yep. And I rescued it from the cat after, you know, I removed the cat from the situation because the mantis wasn't going anywhere. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that, that was the first time I'd ever seen it because usually even when you pick one up, they're not going to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I had that with my, I used to, I actually started with a lot of the arthropods because like I said, a uh, poultry and I had quail that were in the backyard. I free ranged my quail in the little backyard and I heard this hissing sound. And the first thing I thought was kitten. I was like, is that a, a kitten somewhere? And I turned around and the quail was like squared off with a full size praying mantis that was rubbing whatever there's, they have a spot on their body that has some uh, texture. So it'll make that hissing sound. Right. And it it won. The quail was like, mm, not worth food. I'll go over somewhere else. So it de I actually got to watch that display in action and the quail be like, yeah, too big of a bug. <laughs> yeah, not worth it. <laughs> so Newt Scamander wants to know what your favorite, favorite mantis or just favorite arthropod that you keep is. Arthropod is definitely the... I, every bone in my body says this is the coolest thing. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, Amblypidae are just, not only are they like 
ornate and or kind of terrifying a little bit, but they're also big babies and they're super mm-hmm. sensitive to like everything. Like they'll use their antenna form leg. So their longest leg that looks like an antenna is actually their first set of legs. And then they'll like reach around behind things to check to see if anything's it's their like purposefulness is just insane. So Amblopygy for sure. And then as far as mantis ghosts, just because they're so easy to be arthropod ambassadors, they, you can actually care for them and then therefore they can really get into a household and infect people with that need to love bugs. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, I I've, I've thought ghost mantis would be cool to have sometime, yeah, especially with their pseudo communal nature. Can I put it that way? <laughs> yeah, no, keep them fed. They're, they're okay. Till they're adult females, then they're hungry. <laughs> cool. Uh, okay, Cookie Bro or Cokie Bro wants to know if uh, mantis can bite your skin and rip it. Have you ever had that happen? The lar- If you let them, the larger ones could get through your skin, I would <laughs> say, especially if you got soft hands. Um, But most species, especially most of the species in the hobby are, again, pretty timid and or not that mechanically apt. Mm -hmm. Size, I mean, the bigger you get, the harder you bite. But but also it's going to take a second. So just like remove it from your finger or let it happen if you need that experience. Um, (laughs) (laughs) You got to, what is it? Brave wilderness. You got to coyote it. (laughs) It bit. It's good so, for the views, I've heard. That'll really no, rocket your it's channel right up. Here. It's <laughs> right here. So Crystal's Pets and Plants wants to know how often should bring mantis be fed? That's a good question. Yeah. Um, I look at abdomen size. It's gonna depend on what they ate last. How if you if you have a plump abdomen, I say avoid a piece of paper and aim for a Christmas bulb. So you want that like kind of elongated abdomen. Um, versus when they're thin, they'll be thin when they just molt. And then after a molt, they'll need time to uh, harden up, which isn't drying out because if it was drying out, then we wouldn't have any aquatic inverts. True. True. It's really (laughs) claritizing, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, that would be. Okay. Cool. So um, let's see. Catching up. So Koki Bro wants to know, how do you handle a mantis? So a the lot of times know? they're, if they're in defense mode and they don't want anything to do with you, leave them alone for a second. Kind of like a tarantula. Like you can kind of, if you, if you are handling tarantulas, there's still certain times you should not because it's not in the mood. Don't just force it. Mm-hmm. Um, past that, I'll usually try to give them a spot and then push behind and allow them to kind of come on to, but a lot of the cryptic species will just like drop to the bottom of their cage and then you can kind of just pick them up and they'll realize they're not being eaten. But mm-hmm. yeah, uh, certain species, if you want to get a hold of like a native one that you don't want to bite you, and this is a nice species to show this on, but you can kind of grab behind on their thorax behind so that you're holding their arms from going outward, if that makes sense. Uh, like that. Uh-huh. Yeah, and that'll keep them from being able to turn because you, you've got their shoulders tucked. And this is also a very hard area between here and there. So it's it's a spot you can kind of grab without. And their abdomens are soft and their heads are intricate. But right here is pretty. Pretty safe. Nice. Yeah, so. But past that, just let it continue on its way because it wants to go up. Most of the time they want to go up. So you can kind of treadmill it up to some yeah. degree. And just let it figure out. A lot of times I get them to a spot where I'm hanging out and then just let them hang out because they're slow enough that, especially if they have a, a tree or something that they're hanging up on, it's not natural for them to go down. So they'll kind of just hang on there and wonder where they go next. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so a lot of handling for me is getting them out and then not handling them, just enjoying them. Makes sense. Okay, so Science Slayer wants to know if mantids are related to stick bugs or is it convergent evolution? Convergent. Uh, stick bugs are closest, I think, to grasshoppers, if I remember right, whereas mantises and cockroaches are in the same family, and those split off before that a little further back. So, yes, in that, you know, they're in the arthropod family and they're a couple branches down similar, but not so close that the stick was both a mantis and a phasmid. They were. Right. And convergent evolution is awesome. Good, good drop. 
That's yeah. one of my favorite things about a lot of showing off animals is that kind of a like this this problem has been solved a few times. And this is the result each time. Right, and it's it's cool to see how they they differ, uh, and and how they're similar. It's it's kind of fascinating. To see how that works. So Eddie Young says, "I kept critters all my life and always will. Do either of you have any real concerns of zoonotic diseases or zoonotic parasites in our hobby?" So just for everybody, not maybe not everybody knows what that means. Basically, it's diseases or parasites that humans can catch from animals. So let's let's talk about that. Um, I mean, I know that one of my issues I've actually run into is there's wild turkeys in this area and they actually carry a parasite that will infect um, earthworms. And now that parasite is also in my chicken coop because my chickens are outside. I don't have a sterilized building that I keep my animals in and they're chickens, so they eat earthworms. Um, most of those species are also like tough enough that it doesn't like weigh on their health. So you actually have to get them tested to even know this and who, who tests their outdoor chickens. Uh, so that kind of transmission does have a, not an arthropod, but a, a creepy crawly in the mix. I, as far as like skin transfer, if I was eating arthropods, I'd definitely cook them. I know that's an issue with crayfish in the area. There's certain parasites that that's one of the reasons you need to cook them thoroughly. Mm -hmm. But past that, I can't think of anything in the hobby that's been a concern. But again, that's something we don't really look into. Everything I can think of that's parasitic is like tropical and or the animal itself, not something that it's carrying. And also none of, there's some people ask me about my assassins because there's the, there's a certain assassin kissing bug. Oh, the Chagas disease. Yeah. yeah. And so they're like, oh, you have assassins. Why would you keep those? They give you kissing death. And I'm like, oh, no, no, no. That, they're in the same like very large umbrella family. But most of those kind of issues are uh, pretty, they're not going to be in every single species of a larger group. They're going to have one or two carriers. Right. If any of those are in the hobby and or they still, even if they're a carrier species, need to have access to that parasite. So the issue would be the initial import. Right. Right. Yeah. I remember looking into that and I believe it's only one family of assassin bugs that carries it. And uh, none of the like the mambo white spot or the horrid kings or anything are anywhere near that. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, because they're the critters that carry it, they're getting it and spreading it because they're biters of flesh. They're not hunters that do the amazing awesome things that assassins do there's right. such amazing predators they are <laughs> if i could get away with it i'd probably keep some but but i've definitely had people like oh why would you keep those that can cause this so I, I i know there are people concerned about it in the hobby so I'm, I'm guessing if it was a thing people would have figured it out by now but always questioning is also how we figure it out so exactly so all right coming down uh, making sure I, I'm trying to make sure I didn't miss anything. Okay, so a couple things. Um, it's hard to catch all of them, but I wanted to make sure that you get a chance to showcase some of the stuff that you have that we haven't talked about yet. Is there something there you want to just show us that we haven't gotten to? Yeah, I mean, uh, we're talking about keeping and that, and that's one way to interact with arthropods because you're you're there to see that animal and have like a, a connection that really makes you wonder where does this animal come from? What habitat is it? You know, is it okay in the wild? And that really connects us with the world around us in a way that makes us caring individuals. Another thing that I really like to look at is what people that maybe weren't as interested in that animal have other things that they might be interested in, and so. I'm working on uh, the mobile zoo. I don't know if you saw that project. And part of that is trying to think if it's not just the animal, how do I catch that person that like their kids looking at this, but maybe they're not interested. So I'm really interested in art. And like I said, Mother Spiders did this piece. And then Tetraceras has this adorable little C. elegans stamp. Oh, awesome. She's just so good at stuff like this. And she sent this to me last Valentine's Day. So thank you for that. Um, and also just like art, art, artistic uh, renditions of insects. So this is a bunch of different males that so they oh. really have a, oh, no worries. so it almost kind of looks like a angel sort of a thing. So just like uh, more abstract representations of insects. And then past that, there's like, uh, I've been doing stickers. And so just that, again, the like idea of having a different way to interact if an individual doesn't get you to be inspired by animals. And so just being able to really see all of that without having to care, you know, have to feed it every day. Yeah. 
Yeah. Same thing. I'm trying to get it. Has has your wife uh, looked at this yet? Cause yes. <laughs> tarantula. <laughs> it has. I showed yeah, her. I was you, excited. I gotta, to oh, if he's out, I have an adult boy. Yeah, there he is. He's a, oh, I hate this camera. He's right there. So he's barely the size of my thumb. And he's like, why am I on camera right now? <laughs> the males are just like the reason I took a photo of them was to blow them up so I could be more content with having this size of tarantula. But that's an adult. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so as far as tarantula, it blows most of the conceptions out of the water. But still, arachnophobia is something to tackle. That's um, true. I have also the the necklace I'm wearing is Ento Whimsy. Woo -doo 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 -doo. This is done by her, and they're the beetle beetle wings. Oh, so cool! That's using insects in a way that if any of these other things didn't pique your interest, it's jewelry. It's something totally different. Yeah, yeah. Like that. <laughs> and then also uh, composting. Uh, uh, one of the species I really enjoy. Like I said, I, I kind of uh, went with the aspect of poultry keeping and just yeah. having something that maybe you can feed your chickens and or do compost with. So this is an ivory roach. Oh, let's take a look at that. Oh, wow. And for, you know, a cockroach, they're very gentle. They don't really have the spikes that some of the species have. And they are the best composters. And what I actually do, you'd be interested in this. Once they're done, I feed them like alfalfa pellets and then whatever it needs to go from the compost, uh, veggies and fruit that don't have insecticidal, like no alliums, so no onions and garlic and things that kind of have insecticidal properties. But other than that, lots of different foods. Right. And then they make up kind of a semi broken down, not quite soil yet, not really a bacterial breakdown besides whatever bacteria was through their process. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot still left in what I sift out of there and the isopods love it. And so Go I actually that. feed my isopods the aspen fiber that has feces in it from the snakes, as well as my sifted cockroach bin is like, yeah, isopod nibbles. They love it. So uh, just trying to, that's one of my focuses with my collection is trying to really link everybody together so that the waste stream is dynamic and then ends up in the garden when I grow food. Right. Yeah, I love that. I think that's, like you said, I, that's something that I'm really interested in. And I, I like to, to feed uh, my snake feces to my isopods and stuff like that. And um, I am fascinated by the idea of anything, any creature that can be kept as a composter. I've, I've done red worm composting before mm -hmm. and, of course, iso composting. <laughs> and there are species that work better for that. But it seems like roaches are really an excellent, excellent uh, choice. As far as that yeah, goes. They stay drier. I've always been hesitant to try to do the worm bins because they're wet enough that if they're indoors, if you're in an apartment, they're just going to be a fruit fly bin with worms mm -hmm. in it. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas the cockroaches don't allow anything like that to settle in to the point that you don't get any infestations. Right. If you keep they're... them right. I mean, if you kept them soaked, but they don't need that. So as long as they have a moisture regiment, they don't need to have a, a wet corner that stuff can take hold in. Exactly. I think that's a great advantage of them. Um, Therapod hunters asking, are ivory cockroaches capable of being communal? Oh, they do really well. Um, they'll do some wing nibbling. That's usually a sign that they have a uh, lack of protein in their diet. So up your fish food and some whatever else protein base you have for them. But past that, they, uh, they love being a just churning pile of bug. And they're, <laughs> they're a swarm species, so they're kind of... I've kind of talked about it with arachnophobia as well. I feel like some of our brains, especially some of the bug people in the hobby, we're still freaked out by stuff like a swarm and or a creepy crawly, but our brains are like a happy excited instead of a scared excited. So like seeing, I mean, you've probably seen, you've probably feel it when you see your isopods swarm. It's like, that's so many isopods. This should freak me out. <laughs> it's so cool though. And so yeah, yeah. Those cockroaches will scratch that itch for sure. The death's heads and stuff like that are a little bit more gentle about approaching their food. So if you don't want that, there are species that aren't like that. So you can really cater to what you're interested in because there's so many roach species. <laughs> yeah. I remember when you were talking about that, how the, we react to these things with fascination instead of fear. Some of us do, and yeah. and we're of course in that camp. Uh, my wife is, you know, she'll she'll say, "Well, isopods are cute, yeah, but if if you show me a thousand of them together, it's going to make me uncomfortable." Yeah. And to me, I'm just like, "Oh, that's this is really cool. I, I want to <laughs> get a feeding response. You know, drop it in and watch a thousand isopods swarm over a zucchini, or whatever." And I love that. Yep. 
Yeah, I think it's hitting our same primal buttons. And that's, I, I, I try to describe it as fascination through fear. Like fear is our initial response. And if you push through that, you'll get like weirdly excited about it. And I see it in the tarantula hobby all the time. A lot of tarantula people are either still semi-arachnophobic or used to be arachnophobic. And it seems right. like their brain still holds that excitement, but it got flipped. Too. Yeah, they get the adrenaline. <laughs> is the tarantula hobby. <laughs> yeah, they get the adrenaline and the dopamine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah. 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 You and, chemicals out. <laughs> that's like what Richard said. I mean, Richard got into it because uh, he was initially afraid, terrified of the tarantula. So, yep. so Sandy Sizemore wants to ask about the ivory roaches. She's saying, uh, do they fly or climb? Ni neither. They're very nice about. They'll if you drop them and or if you're holding them up and they want to go down, they'll open their wings on their fall. You know, they, they, they'll do a Buzz Lightyear. They'll fall in with style. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but they're not going to take off and they're not. That's that's the other thing about roaches. There's so many species that like there's most of the ones in the hobby are pretty easy to care for and or containable until you get into the like really interesting corners of the hobby and then you need to get better bins um, <laughs> but, the, but the ivories and they're kind of similar to the male uh if you have dubia they're, they have wings but unless they're gliding down they're not going to just poof out of the compost bin <laughs> right so it's more of a parachute than a rocket launcher kind of yep your biggest worry is same with the isopods if you like get debris on the sides and you like missed it to the way that the debris like solidifies on so just keep your keep your container clean a lot of people suggest doing, especially with like climbing species, um, a Vaseline ring. I don't know if you've ever heard about that. Yeah, yeah. I have found it works until you think it's working and then it doesn't because a lot of times if you get a mite infestation, the mites will stick to the Vaseline and turn it into like a cockroach ladder. Yeah. So I'm like hesitant to suggest that. Just get a gasket. Don't pretend that they can't because they will. Yeah. So I, I don't give the Vaseline advice. It's a common one in the hobby that I've had fail for me. And that's not the best thing for your partner and you. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, when I kept ants years ago, I remember using a Vaseline ring to keep them in their enclosure. And uh, it worked until it got dirty. Yeah. And they would drop pieces of, you know, debris on it. And yeah. kind of make oh, ants are so... <laughs> yeah it's insane i always that that ants canada when he has them he puts the pitcher plant in their enclosure mm -hmm. have you seen that one yet i haven't seen that one uh -uh. They, they, he has an overcrowded enclosure so he's like well i'll put a pitcher plant in and it'll at least eat some of them it probably won't really change the population much but we'll see what happens the ants figure i mean not figured it out they beep bop boop this isn't working yes and no however ants think but they started putting their trash into the pitcher and they filled the pitcher up so that they couldn't fall in anymore. And the pitcher was creating more sugar for them because it was like really well fed. <laughs> so they turned, yeah, they you turned know, an enemy like, into a symbiotic uh, relationship. <laughs> one ant colony out in somebody's front room with a video camera and that happened. And I'm just like, how do we... Bugs are just, they're amazing. That's amazing. <laughs> that is fantastic. And and Ants Canada is really, really good about uh, highlighting the story. <laughs> yeah, he kind of, he makes it into like a serialized story instead of yeah, just like a YouTube job. video. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Okay. Young Lad has a question about isopods. Let's see. It says, my armadillidae and vulgari used to eat so much, but now it seems like they don't eat as much. Also, they haven't been breeding for a while, and after those 13 random deaths, I've been scared. Hmm. You want to chime in on that? And bust. I've had mine kind of bloom and bust as far as, like, mm -hmm. why are there so many zebras? And then just, like, oh, they're not. But I also have varying care, so it's mm -hmm. probably following that pattern. <laughs> I definitely think that can have to do with it, like how recently has the substrate been changed and that kind of thing will, will definitely change how much they're breeding. Also, um, I would say there there is a carrying capacity. A lot of people contact me and they say, I want to get isopods, but I'm really worried that I'm going to start out with you know, 13 and eventually I'm going to have 700 in there and they're just going to keep breeding. What am I going to do about it? How am I going to control their population? And I generally try to indicate to them, you know, there is a, a carrying capacity. And you, you can't provide them with infinite food in, in a small enclosure like that. It's impossible. They're going to reach an equilibrium to some extent. And it depends on the species, of course. Some will, you know, outbreed their uh, confines a little easier than others. But in general, if you don't overfeed them, 
they're going to find a place where they're sort of comfortable in their enclosure. Yeah, and just looking at it from a food studies perspective, most of the times when you hit a wall, you're missing a certain thing. So maybe they need a dose of calcium or some other thing that they're missing in a way that's really putting them at the, at the inability to move forward. So I don't yeah. know, like, all those nutritional nitpicky stuff because something might not be there. That's a good point. Yeah, and in isopods, uh, though they get calcium from leaves, they get calcium from fish food and so on. If you put a calcium source in there, they're going to munch it down, and that may be a limiting factor just because maybe your population reaches a certain point. So that's a great point. Um, Wally is asking about bug border. Have you ever tried bug border? Bug border. Oh, Which the, like the uh, I think that one's diatomaceous yeah. earth based. Is it? I think that's a, a way to get people to pay too much money for diatomaceous earth and or pyrethrin, which is marigold pretty much. Mm -hmm. It might have pyrethrin in it. So if it, I, I use just diatomaceous earth because I know that that has a physical issue with the insects. So I'm not going to accidentally gas off something that's going to poison my collection itself. But I have, so my fruit fly cultures, Anybody who's in the insect hobby, that's 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 where we're, we're all just raising fruit flies. And then this is a, <laughs> this is a fancy result of raising fruit, fruit flies, let's, let's be honest. Um, but my fruit fly cultures are in a big 28 flat liter container that has a bed of diatomaceous earth. I think off. that's what bug because I think bug block is because bug blade, it's often called, I know, but it's the subatomic diatoms that it's made out of are small enough to scratch and destroy the exoskeleton as well as getting in the sphericals and things like that. So that's the function on that one. And then the pyrethrin is more of a chemical toxin. Well, it sounds like this one is more like a fluon or Vaseline type thing. He's okay. saying an inch, an inch around the top stops insects from getting past. And it's probably Vaseline, but fancy. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I, I, so many uh, things in the pet trade are like, <laughs> something really cheap <laughs> that you don't True. Know. it's like when you go buy like a little flake of alfalfa for your rep you know, like rabbit at petco and it's like 15 dollars for a handful of hay <laughs> as as a rancher i'm just like <laughs> what yeah you can go it's, to the, feed the same store. price as a quarter ton <laughs> exactly <laughs> exactly Let's see. So Insane Isopods wants to know what the top tips for breeding isopods fast. Get the species that breed fast. That's true. <laughs> yeah, get the dairy cows. <laughs> dairy cows. You'll, you'll speedy, speedy. <laughs> yeah. And make sure you have, uh, you get, make sure you, you give them supplemental food, but don't ever let them run out of leaf litter and they'll go like crazy. It almost seems like uh lots of I, I find my ice pods really like having a lot of upside down area to hang out on it almost seems like that's one of their if you want to give them a lot more area that might get you going that's true Don't you mix can... species that'll, that'll slow you down <laughs> uh, that's true i learned that very early on with uh, dwarf whites i my my founding culture of uh, spanish orange had some dwarf whites in it when i got it mm -hmm. and i didn't realize what was going on at the time because I was new in the hobby years and years ago, right? And uh, realized, oh, those aren't babies. Those are something else. And I looked uh, them up and found out what was going on and separated them successfully. But it, uh, yeah, it wasn't working very well at first. I've actually avoided getting dwarf whites because I've only ever heard that there's plenty of them and they're a pain. So I have the purples and I'm sure they're just as bad and I just don't see it because <laughs> they blend <laughs> right in. But they haven't spread to like random isopod enclosures because i have been one of the people that have kept two species that can't i'll try to avoid like putting two porcelio in but i'll do like an armadillidium and a porcelio just to see mm -hmm. it seems like the adults do fine but one species will predate on the other's young yeah so in my case i had gestroy in with magnificus mm -hmm. and i still had plenty of adult magnificus and a lot of every size gastroi, but I went ahead and took the magnificence out because they obviously were predating on the young. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So they're still there and they're not hurting each other, but are you seeing the full? <laughs> full picture, yeah. exactly. Yeah, and, and that seems to be where it happens. I agree, just with the, the really young ones is where most of the problems are occurring. Let's see. Um, there's a lot of questions here. I wanted to was one that I really wanted to make sure we covered. Um, 
I'm missing it now. Oh, I wanted to ask you about your, uh, you had some jumping spider enclosures there. Yeah, I've been trying to figure out, because so jumping spiders are one of those like high airflow, humidity, every once in a while spritz, don't spritz them too much because you can uh, book, so a little bit of anatomy of a spider, but their book lungs are on their stomach and that's where they breathe from. They don't have the side spiracles like a lot of invertebrates. Right. And so if they're in a mist that's deep enough for the young, if you're super small slings, they'll actually be able to drown because they, they're literally dragging their lungs in the water. So uh, that's what keep an eye on. Um, so if you do have something that missed that you're missing, you kind of want it to lose its air pretty quick. So these are from the dollar store. Another thing is I don't want to pay that much. <laughs> so we've got spots all the way along. There's little, ooh, try to get the light to not be there. little man right here. Let's see if I can make this bigger here. I'm going to try. Here okay, here we go. So there he is. I have a little circle right there. Sometimes they'll use it. Sometimes they won't. Um, and then air holes all the way along both tops and on both sides. And my little... There we go. So that's, that's the setup. And then I also have enough down here to hold some of the moisture when it sprays. So there's a little bit of uh, ambient release. Right. And I've been doing those with, this one is actually my first Amblypygi. And I was sold a Tanzanian whip, which is this monster. And it was actually like a Florida whip. Uh -huh. I was like, no, 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 no. That's not what's going on here. You're kidding me, right? Um, but they can't grip surfaces like the jumpers can. So I actually put a full piece of this is glued on so he can't get between it. But he, I've, you never see him using it until you sometimes us invert people wake up in the middle of the morning with a flashlight just to be able to see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think my amplified gear out until three in the morning when they're all out and they're, they're out. a little night party. Yeah. So those those enclosures have been working well. I have one venomness that she needs to be moved up, but I really like the idea of being able to really see their tunnels uh -huh. and where they navigate. Oh and so one of the important things about designing the zoo is being able to I mean I would take this tarantula out and just have this on display just to show the architecture. Like it's really yeah, interesting okay. to me. And that kind of removes the arachnophobic element for <laughs> So yeah, these these enclosures have been doing doing well. Um, they stay closed pretty well. This one's venomous enough that it doesn't hurt to have some rubber bands on it. Makes sense. Almost so, for visual cue more than safety. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense too. Yeah. So did the uh, the little orchid babies? You said you got. Oh, let's see. I'm gonna. Here she uh, is. Here's everybody's in. favorite. Let's just go ahead and play orchid games. Oh yeah. So, and these guys, they're they're one of the ones I mentioned that you're gonna want high humidity, but good airflow, because you're going to get an infection as quickly as kill it with low humidity. So you've got that mix of concern, as well as, oh, how do I say this gently? Some people will be like, I want a male and a female orchid. Can you get me that? And it's like, you are going to watch your male die, and your female is going to be this big. <laughs> and you can't, some people say you can change their feeding and change their temperatures and stretch it out, but I I don't think you're gonna have healthy animals stand of it. So these two are actually siblings. And that's Mr. Wow. Man, and he's adult. <laughs> and this is Missy, not ready, which is nice because I'm, a lot of people ignore it in the hobby, but I'm really worried about uh, genetic diversity in the hobby because we only have so many imports. And if there is a mess up in the DNA and those animals are the only ones we have to breed together, but if we have some genetic diversity in trade. So I'm, if anybody wants to work with mantises, I'm, really into trading genetics and getting healthy stock and it being less of a you know being careful that the hobby is about the health of the animals and not like individuals getting their sales in so exactly yeah, yeah. <laughs> so people get kind of worried about it like i'm too nice and they're just like what is this i'm just like i want more more people to see more bugs <laughs> bug this. exactly <laughs> and I, this should I think be that's... fun <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, I think that's that's a great great way to look at it. We and just getting that gene pool as deep as possible just makes all kinds of sense, really. So, yeah. well, and the just uh, like I said, a lot of people just say no. They're they breed together in the wild all the time. They don't have a life ways that separates and similar to amphibians. That's how you get the speciation to begin with. But right. at the same time, if you have a species in captivity and you're consistently only breeding nest mates together if there is a blip and an incorrectly 
done piece of DNA, which happens. That's how genetic degradation happens. And so not being able to reflect fresh and replace that blip with a genetics that hasn't had that issue. Right. But they both, they have DNA. Some people say it doesn't work that way, but DNA is DNA. Copying DNA is copying DNA. Accidents happen sometimes. Not enough that it's like very provable, but err on yeah. the side of better community. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And you and you get people who say, uh, you know, inbreeding depression is showing up in in certain strains of things, especially with their line bread and stuff like that, even within vertebrates. And it just doesn't make sense to me that it doesn't exist in vertebrates. Because like you say, DNA is DNA. Yeah. And, and I think I think a lot of it is similar to the um, bins argument with snakes, like people have done it in that way. And it's been successful in a way that they don't want to admit any issues so they just either avoid it or like adamant against it when yeah the further we go the more we learn as citizen scientists and we should incorporate that instead of doing it the same way we've done it exactly is my sloppy opinion of messy genetics <laughs> <laughs> well one thing i wanted to talk about too is uh you you mentioned how you can i'll probably paraphrase it in kind of a weird way but Basically, the idea that um, the insects and other arthropods are small solutions to big problems, basically. Can you tell us more about some of your thoughts in that direction? I mean, similar to the co uh, goodness, divergent evolution, things were, things are coming back together and solving. Insects have had so many times that they've run into problems that all different species have run into similar problems and they've solved it. And so you have like ants that are farming fungus and different kinds of like chemical, like they're using leeches to figure out like medical research on blood like clotting and things like that. Um, one of the ones that I've been focused on recently and I still need to continue my research on secondary breakdown, but mealworms can eat styrofoam, quote yeah. unquote. And mm -hmm. I don't know if you've read into that studies, they actually did an isotopic signature on the carbon in the polystyrene polymer, excuse the science. <laughs> and found that that carbon in there was in the chitin of the mealworm, meaning the mealworm didn't just chew it because whatever it might be food, oh, it wasn't, I just ate through it. The mealworm was actually incorporating the carbon, which means that the microbes in the mealworm's gut could break down and utilize polystyrene. And most of the time when people hear me talk about that, they go, well, aren't you worried about the poisons and the toxins? It's, it's bad, it's styrene, it's bad, it's and styrofoam. And I'm like, well, what's styrofoam made out of? And they're like, I don't know, bad stuff. It's poisonous. And I'm like, yeah, okay. Um, chemistry is real. <laughs> and it's act the polymer is just nitrogen carbon very closely in to the point that it can't break up. And that's what we don't like about it is we can't break it down. Right. But it's not, there's no uh, metals or strange, like there's certain organic chemicals can still be dangerous. Cyanide is also nitrogen carbon, if I'm correct. Um, but there's not like heavy metals and things. So the only chemical I can imagine looking at the structure that might be being gassed off is benzene, which is still toxic. And it's one of the things that like in oil refineries, people worry about because oil is also a natural product. Right. Trips people out to think that <laughs> oil is a carbon based dead dinosaurs and or the carn Diatoms carniferous and yeah, period. So yeah, there's looking at those problems and instead of being scared of them, looking at what's happening. And so you have an insect that's breaking styrofoam down and incorporating it into its own self in a way that you can then feed that insect to chickens and things like that. And they actually found that the mealworms after a few generations got better at breaking down the styrofoam. Mm -hmm. You just need to look at, you know, what you'd need to supplement as far as phosphorus and all the other basic elements for that diet. But past that, you could grow mealworms on styrofoam. Yeah, yeah. I've actually experimented with that a little bit myself, and uh, I have a chunk of styrofoam that has a bunch of mealworm hole drills in it that I have taken on for bug presentation to show people and talk about that a little bit. Um, I did notice that the mealworms, although they ate it and did fine, they needed, of course, uh, some sort of a form of hydration, so I would give them polyacrylamide crystals, you know, soaked in water to, to give them that. But it did seem like, uh, like you were saying, there's some other elements that they need for long-term yeah. health and survival. So it'd be interesting. Yeah, I actually to noticed my this. mealworms that were eating just styrofoam. I actually have a photo of it. I should probably post back on my 
thing and refresh the the styrofoam colony because I was keeping them I was sciencing so I was keeping them separate and the styrofoam mealworms weren't the ones I was feeding my inverts I was keeping everything just just for science sakes and they were more see-through you could actually see through the mealworms that were eating styrofoam after a few generations interesting like, oh yeah uh, yeah, that just, is interesting. yeah if anybody wants to science nerd on that contact me because i i think the second step to the experiment which i've heard um a surfboard company does the same thing and then they finish breaking it down through some sort of a fungal uh something so like take they took it out in the woods and found some sort of a mushroom that could also work on that carbon waste from the mealworm so cool like the second stage yeah. the next step yeah that's what cool. we're doing next but i need to do a cro cryptography like chemical test and most of the chemical tests in this area are all based on like uh, liquid tests they don't really have dry matter tests it's kind of hard uh, and i'm worried about the inaction mealworms gassing off the benzene so i'd actually have to test the like <laughs> <laughs> mm, yeah, I can see that being a problem. Yeah, and it's science. really, really fascinating. You should mention the, the color difference, the transparency. I've noticed that when I have mealworms in a more bioactive setup, mm -hmm. that they get darker. Okay, yeah. Maybe they're taking up tannins from the leaflet or something. I don't know. But uh, the mealworms get a lot darker. Superworms, too, tend to, when I keep them in a setup like that, than in just like a normal oats setup or something. So mm -hmm. it's just kind of the flip side of that same thing, perhaps. Being able to access different chemical tannins and chemicals, too. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, those, those kind of solutions, chemical solutions, as well as just like physical solutions. Like they talk about the mantis shrimp having that crazy, like how they can move so fast to cause cavitation and a small like sonic boom or whatever. And it's, it's mm -hmm. just based on a piece of their chitin being like a saddle shape that springs itself. Just those kind of things are amazing. And like I said, those animals figured out how to do it. And we're just like, not all the answers are right there. You just gotta look at them. Yeah, yeah. Well, I realize um, we've already gone past an hour, which is amazing because it didn't seem to, uh, that it took any time at all to get this far. Um, and uh, it's been great. I want to make sure uh, two things. One, is there anything that we've missed that you would like to cover? And then two, um, when people want to get in contact with you, they want to follow you on social media, they want to check out what you're doing, how do they get there? So those two questions I've got for you. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, one of the things I like about bugs is you can go outside and find bugs. And so the hobby is amazing and there's really beautiful animals and that's one aspect of it. But at the same time, like being familiar with your own backyard and being interested in the animals that you can find outside is, is important as well. And so the, the contrast in conservation, like you see this amazing tarantula and you want to save where it's from, that's being deforested. That's important. And that's a lot of the push, but also your influence where you live, you're a citizen there and you have the ability to really make change. And when you go outside and find out all these other species that are, that you're finding interest in that maybe are having issues in their environment. Yeah. Get, get familiar with that kind of stuff. It's really interesting. I find that when I'm raising cockroaches and to feed as feeders and things like that, I'm suddenly not eating organic vegetables because I think it's ethical for me. I'm actually just worried that it's, if I'm using conventional, it has a spray on it that's going to kill my insects. So all of a sudden, I'm having a better diet because I'm feeding cockroaches. Like <laughs> it's, so it, it, being interested in insects really gets our mind going in all aspects of our life, which I think is really important. It's um, true. And then past that, yeah, I, I'm mostly active on Instagram. I think I have a Facebook open to tell people to get off Facebook and go find me somewhere else. Um, <laughs> but, and I, I have like a little blurb up on a dot com. It's a arthropod dash ambassadors. Um, and then currently have most, I'm, I'm running a GoFundMe for the mobile bug zoo. And so trying to put mm -hmm. together a bicycle sized cart that I can take out. We're in sunny ish Oregon and the weather's not too bad for a few months out of the year. So I'm really want people to meet these animals that are stuck in homes. So I'm trying to design a way to go out there and let people meet them, as well as um, I want to have a portfolio together of insect artists and insect jewelry makers, things, just everything arthropod really catch everybody's attention. So I'm putting a mobile, mobile bug zoo together that's on GoFundMe. And I have a YouTube channel because 
I like showing people bugs and a lot of the YouTubes I saw with mantises, there's a few really good mantis YouTubers, but a lot of them were just like, hey, I just got this mantis, isn't that neat? I'm gonna talk about it for a while, the things I read, and then that's it. And usually yeah. it's somebody like talking to you and I'm like, I wanna see the bug. So all of my, <laughs> Insta all of my YouTube is the bug. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, yeah so those, are, those are my main, main focuses currently and trying to, I, COVID's kind of put everything on pause. I'm trying to use that in a healthy way and really design everything. I think that we're gonna relook education after all of this. So I think that I wanna be on Definitely. the good end of new educational striving. So. Right. Cool. Well, that's awesome. Well, uh, I have to thank you. This has been really great. And I hope uh, a bunch of people go and check out everything you've got uh, going on. Um, it's been really fun. I've learned some some great stuff. And I think we had some excellent questions and you, you've filled them really well. So I'm really excited about it and uh, looking forward uh, to talking to you again in the future. Maybe uh, we could have you back on sometime if you're interested. Would be stoked. Yeah. More bugs, more people. That's, that's my goal. Once the once the rain stops around here, I'll have some nice outdoor stuff. I've I've been trying to add a lot more uh, nature walks to the YouTube, but it's currently cool. the, the gooey time of year. So most everything yeah. is hiding, <laughs> including the humans. Yeah. Hopefully yeah. do some nice nature walks. And your your focus on the biological aspect and is just just having a nice place to go and learn tricks for culturing. Because like I said, a lot of this hobby is there's a little tiny foundation of fruit flies somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> sure enough. You, you do a great job at, yeah, representing all of those seemingly kind of difficult topics. Cool. So thank, well, thank you so you. much. Yeah. Thank you. And thank thanks you. everyone for watching. Super fun. Lives are always, yeah, just, you kind of get rolling. It's not quite as intimidating as I thought. Like I said, I'm not on the screen very often, so that's for you guys. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it worked out really well. Well, thanks everybody. And if, Aaron, if you can stay on the, uh, I'm going to end the broadcast in just a second. If you can stay on for a second, Perfect, yeah. that would be great. Oh, All right. and if you want to oh, hear me talk again, uh, the end Russ talk again, we've got exotic pet collector. Yes. Yes. That. Check it out. <laughs> um, that is, it's a really fun podcast. And though some of the episodes are focused on tarantulas, that's awesome. So enjoy those. And there are, there are episodes that are focused on different things like isopods or, um, when uh, he talked to Aaron, they talked about tarantulas, but they also talked about lots of other cool stuff. So, yeah, he's had uh, great people on every single yeah. time. It's mind blowing. And the podcast format, it's uh, everybody's on YouTube, and that's great. I watch it on YouTube, but like the podcast format, you can kind of do something else. So, if anybody likes yep. the podcast format, that's I find I can get a lot of chores done listening to them. Yep, I, I'm doing chores and I'm exercising and stuff when I listen to it, and it's great. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, we're going to end it here and uh, see you all soon. Bye. Thanks for joining in.